my booth right now. Uh, welcome, ladies and gentlemen. This, as you know, based on what your schedule tells you, it, this is the Billion Dollar Babies panel. How many, how many people were around in 1973? How many people did not need diapers in 1973? Liars! Ladies and gentlemen, I'm a little nervous, so please bear with me right now. I got legends uh, in the back room right now. So without any further ado, I'd like to introduce to you our first guest. He's known as Mr. Alice Cooper's executioner. Let's give a nice round of applause for a fantabulous magician known as Mr. James Reddy! <laughs> Rock and roll. 
And, and when we finally got that, we pretty much alienated every organization in America. And uh, thought, let's take it one step further and bring illusion into it now. Uh, the most dangerous thing in the world was to give Alice Cooper money. Because you know, we were making our own props, and they, we would find things backstage, and that would be the prop for the night. We actually had money now, because schools out did very well. And then all of a sudden, Billion Dollar Babies was the number one record, and we could afford the best guy in the business. So uh, we said, well, let's get Randy, and let's start adding illusion to the show. And that's when we came up with the, you know, the guillotine and, and things like that. And uh, I really wasn't really wasn't uh, willing to put my head in a guillotine without somebody that really knew what they were doing. <laughs> wise, wise decision. Yeah. I must tell you how I heard about it. I don't know whether you know this. Uh, I was in the magic shop, of all places, uh, on 34th Street uh, one afternoon uh, with some of the other magicians sitting around who we were telling one of their stories, and some of them true. And uh, the phone rang, and the proprietor picked up the phone, and he said that he put his hand over the phone, he said, a, a fellow connected with uh, Alice Cooper, I hadn't heard the name, frankly, I must have said I had, and he hadn't heard either. He said, he wants to talk to a magician who will travel with a rock show. And I put up my hand, and I said, I'll do it if he pays me $100 just to talk to him. And he went back to the phone, he said, he'll pay it. $100 was a lot more than $100 today, I can assure you. I got out of there, I burned the stairs as I went down, and I showed up at the Alive Enterprises office. You weren't there. No. And, uh, but Chef was, and uh, several other people. I think Joe Gannon might have been. Joe Gannon, yeah. Yes. No. And uh, I noticed something about the decor. This is great. They had potted plants all over the place, all dead. <laughs> this is a live enterprise, remember? And all the water plants hadn't been watered, they were all dead. I thought that was a good touch, and I said, oh, these are my kind of people. <laughs> and they talked to me, and we made a deal, and I ended up working for the Billion Dollar Baby Show. Yeah, he was the perfect, uh, I think, the perfect foil for Alice. It was a, uh, you know, it was the first time anybody had seen this kind of a show anyways. So when you're adding another dimension to it, all of a sudden you're you're distra you're, you're doing. Uh, Alice would be over here, and Randy would say, "Now when you go over there, we're going to switch this over here," and you know you're you're misdirecting misdirect the audience, and it's all stuff that we wanted to do but didn't know how to do. And that's when we brought Randy in. That he was the guy that really knew how to do all that stuff. Which, which, if I could interject, which was the amazing thing about that because this was live. We were, what, back in 73, what, Rosemary's Baby, things of that nature, right. kind of horror genre was, you know, uh, uh, movie, uh, special effects, the actress in that way. Yeah. This was live, could not be messed up, could not be fooled, could not be tricked, the whole nine yards. You brought in the amazing Randy to chop your head off, and obviously it succeeded because you went on a few other locations after that to carry out those same uh, tricks, I do believe. Well, and, and every night he would be back the next morning alive. And I couldn't figure it out. I thought to stand up. Come on. He doesn't seem to take something very seriously. We, we, we did another bit called, um, uh, it was uh, Unfinished Sweet. And, and the story behind this was we would, uh, the guy would go to a dentist's office and he would get under gas and he would have this dream that he was a, a uh, super spy. So one guitar would be playing the Man from Uncle theme. One guitar would be playing I Spy, and the other thing, the James Bond theme. Now, if you put them all together, they actually all work together. But I would be in the dentist chair, and Randy would come out as the mad dentist. And he had a drill that was bigger than him. And it came down, it was all lit up, and he would start drilling my teeth, and then he would take it down to my crotch. Start drilling my crotch. I don't remember rehearsing that part. I think you never should have I made it up. You improvised that part. Yeah. And, and it was, it, you know, when you see film of this right now, it really, it's very vaudevillian. Uh, but that was the charm of it, I think, was the fact that everything was trying to be high tech, and we went back to the vaudevillian kind of attitude of rock and roll, which, uh, which drew people like, uh, you know, Groucho Marx and uh, Mae West. Groucho Marx would come to the show and bring Mae West, Fred Astaire, Jack Benny, George Burns. They would be standing on the side 
watching the show, the audience was cringing in horror at what was going on. And they were standing there going, ah, 1923, Gracie and I did that. You know? <laughs> <laughs> we were in Toledo, and we had, except uh, the snake he had wasn't as big as that snake. But they, they were not in the least bit alarmed at anything we were doing, because it was vaudeville to them. They, they grew up in vaudeville. So our show had this vaudevillian flavor to it. It was sort of also like that show that you had the carnival that you were, didn't want to go to, but you really wanted to go to. And, you know, there's the big tent, and then there's that show on the right over here that that was the creepy kind of, really, do I want to go in there? You know, that was our show, you know. And uh, we did, our, my audience was not the Crosby, Stills, and Nash audience. <laughs> I was in charge of the Lunatic Fringe, which you, well, never mind. <laughs> Did you know all about that? So we were, we were in charge of all these sort of outcasts and people yeah. that didn't quite fit in, but there were millions of them, you know? Oh, yeah. Uh, yeah. And you remember Baltimore? Well, I remember Baltimore. It's still there, I think. Uh, yes, I think so, yes. <laughs> but I think this, if I'm wrong on this, this is a, Senility creeping in again. But at, at one at point, I remember the chef called a meeting of us all in, in panic. He said, Oh, something really bad has happened. I thought, What now? And uh, you were there, and I think you were a bit puzzled. And he made the announcement. He said that the mayor of Baltimore had given you the key to the city. Do you remember that? Oh, I remember that, yes. yes. And he said, We don't want that. We want the parents to absolutely despise Alice, you see, so that they'll forbid the kids to go, which means the kids have to go. This is a way of forcing the, the audience to be there, and uh, we got over it somehow. Yeah, I don't, we had to insult somebody in order to not get the key to the Something state. like that. <laughs> <laughs> but we, we managed it. Yeah, we, we went out of our way to not try to get those accolades. They came later on, you know. Uh, when you're young and dangerous now, I'm sort of old and treacherous now. Uh, and you know, lovable though. And by doing what you did, by wanting you know that type of audience to appreciate that, you know, well, here we are. Well, <laughs> yes. Uh, yeah, and, and like I said, there, there are millions of you out there. Trust yep. me. <laughs> and you remember when you came to me and said that your mother was going to be in the audience? Yeah. Now, this was in Phoenix, was it? Now, my no, mother's no. probably the most dangerous person you'll ever meet. <laughs> you know, I mean, she is. She doesn't flinch at anything. She's just like, you know. Well, Coop came to me and he said, he, he, was, he was a little, little worried about it. He said, would you mind sitting with my mother should be in the fourth row? We've got reserves each day. Because she's never really seen me act. She doesn't know what I do. Uh, and I thought, well, this is, this is going to be a shock for this lady. I can... I can assure everybody of that, and he was pretty sure of it too. I sat with her, and when Coop walked on stage in the torn costume, tearing up a doll or whatever he was doing at that moment, not a chicken, not a chicken, <laughs> and his mother sat there and said, Oh, Vincent, why is Vincent's costume torn? I can fix that. <laughs> <laughs> and I just patted her on the arm. I was trying to be very, very soft and gentle. I said, yeah, no, this is all part of the act. Wait till you see. And then she started to warm up a little bit, but I had to leave and go and do another part backstage. And when I came back to see her, she was hoping at her. She was, she was with it at that point. Sure. She suddenly realized what the gag was yeah. and who you were and what you were doing and why. Yeah, and she was, uh, you know, she was one of those ones that said, you know, not enough blood. <laughs> you know, I was expecting a little more blood than that in the show. I don't think when the head comes off, the artery shoots out far enough in the audience. My mom and dad both got the show. They, my dad was a pastor, and you know he was one of those guys that, uh, uh, as an example, he would um, he'd be shaving, you know, and I would pick, open the Bible up and I'd say Ezekiel three seventeen. He says the Lord says on oh, me, you know, and he would quote it. That's okay. Um, open it up again. I'd say okay, Matthew uh, five twelve, and he says. And Jesus said unto them, you know, this guy's good. You know, they said, who plays bass for the animals? It was Chaz Chandler. <laughs> <laughs> so the guy was really good. I mean, he, and he really liked the music. He liked what we were doing. He got the fact that I wasn't satanic. You know, he got the fact that was my sense of humor. And I was creating a character that I was going to play. Um, and of course, which was misinterpreted by a lot of people. But uh, uh, 
it, you know, it, it was funny that my parents, I never had a problem with my parents. They wrote all these songs about parents being the problem, whereas my parents were never the problem. Uh, I had the same thing with schools out. I wrote all these songs about, you know, how horrible school was. I was, you know, I was like, I owned my school. Uh, and, you know, I, it was one of those things where, like, uh, I had no problem in school. I had girlfriends doing my homework. I was in a band. I was on the cross-country team. And, you know, I was Mr. Personality, you know. So, you know, yeah, it, it, it was funny. I wrote all these things about things that never happened to me. <laughs> and I was invited to uh, Coop's recent birthday party. Can we name the number? Oh, sure. 60. I was 60. Okay. I was number in all 64 years. Uh, and uh, I was invited to your birthday party, and so many <clears throat> old faces were there. It was a wonderful get together of the old gang. And I met his mother. And I sat with her at a table, and she said, You know, when you joined me in the audience there, I, I didn't know who you were, and I, I didn't know what Vincent was doing up on stage, but you made it very much easier for me. I want to thank you for that. And she remembered the event. No, very, she's, very well. she's sharp as a tack. My mom is still, she's 87, and she's just, you know, uh, sharp as can be. Somewhat older than I? Uh, I don't believe yeah, that. I know. I know. I'm only 84. <laughs> <laughs> you know, we were talking about how back then you were trying to alienate. When we lived in Los Angeles, we got to a point where we were pretty much going to be run out of L.A. Because, uh, you know, it was like we were, people would come to our show to, you know, to leave. <laughs> they would go to the show so they could say they left in the middle of the show. And which attracted Zappa, that's what attracted Frank Zappa to us, is that is that. But um, at one point, Shep says, I have this idea. We're going to go on stage in clear plastic suits with nothing on underneath. And I'm going to call the police and get you arrested. Because it'll be great. It'll be great publicity that Alice Cooper gets arrested. So, of course, you know, we're on stage playing. He calls the police. The police show up. By the time we get there now, the clear plastic suits had heated up. <laughs> you couldn't see anything because it was all, you know, it was all, you know, like, it, and the police, I didn't see anything wrong with this. We couldn't get arrested. <laughs> We literally understood at that point we could not get arrested in L.A. So we moved to Detroit, you know. But we figured we could get arrested in Detroit. But uh, you should tell them the story about uh, when the, the semis didn't arrive with the stage. Oh, what, what city was that in? Oh, man. It was, it was, it was, it was dead. The gas, the, gas, the gas shortage, right? Did it happen during that time? There was a gas shortage during that time. Well, yeah, I don't know what it was, but the, but the semis, the big trucks, didn't arrive at the stage. The stage was monstrous and beautiful. They had a, what, inch and a half of uh, oh, plexiglass? Yeah, yeah, every time you'd step on, on the it would light up. I mean, it was yeah, really yeah, uh, and it was a beautiful stage. I think one of the, the best stages I have ever, and certainly the best stage I have ever personally seen in my life. It was so versatile and so electronified. I mean, really, it, it did react. It was like Busby Berkeley, you know, exactly. on electronic exactly. stage. And, and it didn't arrive, and we had to go out in trucks and pick up used Christmas trees, can you imagine, with some tinsel still hanging on them, and arrange them. We only had to do that for one day. But everybody in the crew, myself, everybody, we all went out and picked up old Christmas trees and spray painted them and put them around the stage. I don't think the kids knew the difference. No. It was, you know, I mean, in, in fact, that's the show I would have wanted to be at. Because it would have been a one-off show. Exactly. Yeah. Okay. And, and I, a lot of times you had to improvise. You oh, know, yeah. uh, one night, uh, you know, the snake was a very big part of the show. I mean, it was only on stage for maybe three three minutes or so. But I go to get the snake, and I had to enter the bathroom. I like to swim at night in the in the in the bathtub, and it was gone. <laughs> and I realized we were in a brand new hotel that didn't have lids on the toilets. <laughs> So it went down into the toilet, into the plumbing of the hotel. This is a snake, this big around. Yeah, yeah. Her name was uh, Yvonne. That was our big snake. Yvonne was Yvonne. Was Yvonne. We had Boa Derrick, we had uh, Julius Squeezer, uh, you know, we had all, you know, little Boa Peep. We had a small one. But this one was our biggest snake, and she's gone. So Randy, all of us are tearing the walls apart in this hotel, trying to find the snake. It came up two weeks later in Charlie Pride's toilet. 
Now, I didn't ask Charlie. Charlie was chasing me at the time, at the Grammys with an axe, I think he was, you know. And I didn't ask him if he was sitting on the toilet at the time, or if he was shaving and just kind of looked over and the snake comes up out of the toilet in a, like in a horror movie. This snake wouldn't hurt anybody. It was like, you know, it was a gentle giant. But I can imagine if you were sitting on the toilet and this thing came up between your legs. Get your attention. 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 Say the least. Yes. You handling that big snake, you could barely walk when you had that snake around your neck. That one was big. She was she was really big, but she was uh, uh, she was probably 12 feet long. And feet. Oh yeah, yeah. 65 pounds. I weighed 90. <laughs> you know, so the snake weighed as much as I did. And all coiled around you. Yeah. Said, constantly fighting the snake off. Not not fiercely or anything like that. He was just sort of trying to arrange it so that he could move around and still move his mouth. Yeah. And this thing was huge. It was really a really big snake. But, um, you know, the snake thing was always great. It was always one of those things that, uh, and everybody finally on the tour got so used to the snake that nobody, even if you had a fear of snakes, you didn't, it didn't bother you anymore, you know. Uh, in fact, the one that I left in here was in the front row on the floor somewhere in there. I don't know. Oh, here it is. Yeah. Oh, never mind. <laughs> okay. Uh, if I could ask a personal question here, and you told me it was pretty okay to, to touch into anything and everything. Um, Mr. Randy, you were originally a Canadian citizen. And I'm from, I'm yes. from what I understand, because of this man sitting next to you, I'm, I'm assuming, I'd like to hear you part of it, you have and are now, or have been, an American citizen due to an incident with the, <laughs> well, that's the, the Mounties, the Canadian Mounties. Yeah, that that's the trigger that set it off. We yeah. did Niagara Falls. You remember Niagara yeah. Falls? Oh, yes, okay. We had a, uh, a large a room full of lockers. It was, I think, the football team's locker room or something, uh, where we could set up the props. And so it was at a school. And uh, I had several parts to play during the show. And uh, I did the opening act and whatnot, went to the dressing room and tried to get in. There was an RCMP, that's Royal Canadian Mounted Police. That's the Canadian equivalent of the FBI, the Federal Police. And uh, he wanted to know where I was going. I said, into the dressing room, I've got to get my costume changed, I've got to get some props. I was looking a little hesitant at this time, I guess. And uh, he said, okay, and he opened the door, and when I walked inside, the RCMP was trashing that locker room. They were very angry because they had come in looking for narcotics, didn't find any, and they decided that they would make a big fuss, and they trashed the room. They were taking doors off lockers and then taking stuff out of the lockers. They had clipped off a lot of the padlocks on the lockers that belonged to the students in the school, the sports team. And uh, I looked around and I saw that my props were pretty well destroyed and uh, I'd have to improvise somehow. And when I left that room, that's the time when I made a decision saying, what the hell do I need Canada for? You've been very good to me, thank you, but no longer I'm going to become an American citizen. And I set out to do it at that very moment. And I, I never regretted the, uh, the decision. Well, the, the, the odd thing, I guess, at the time was the fact that we had a very good reputation for not being druggies. Exactly. You know, we were we drank beer, you know, and that was, we lived on beer, come to think of it, you know. We, we kind of proved that you could live forever on beer uh, if you were in your 20s. Uh, and so we had a very good reputation for never, ever having, uh, and, and the reason was, was because the band that opened for us in 1971 was Cheech and Chong. <laughs> you go over the border with Cheech and Chong in 71. They took everything in our possessions apart. I mean, it was just like unbelievable. And of course, we never had anything, you know. Uh, beer cans is the only thing they could find. And we did finally get a good reputation. Now, I don't know if somebody decided that they were going to make an example of us in, in Niagara Falls or, or not. But I think after that, we, we just went right through the border back and forth without ever, uh, ever changing. Now, it was funny thing was bands like Alice Cooper and Black Sabbath and groups like that, we, we all drank beer. The Mamas and the Papas, James Taylor, <laughs> the Monkees, you know, all had heavy drug problems. I mean, all the, all the, all the groups, you know, that were like uh, the squeaky clean 16 magazine bands were the ones that were all into that stuff. And, and we'd sit there going, ah, I don't want to get involved in that, you know. And as, a, as a layman, as not a, a rock and roll person myself, uh, into this 
and it is ambiance here that I was suddenly plunged into by being hired to chop the man's head off every night and a few other things. Uh, I was very sensitive to that. I thought, oh boy, I thought I'm going to see a lot of dope. I didn't see any trace of it whatsoever. Pot, I could smell pot. Most of that was coming from the audience. Oh, yeah. <laughs> yes. no, give it to Canada. And by the third song, you're going, I killed for a Dorito right now. <laughs> in the middle of the song, and you're going, do we have any Oreos? <laughs> Dying up here. All you had to do was breathe. I don't know what the big deal was around the border, because once you got over there, it was everywhere, you know? Yeah, I mean, yeah. yeah so, but, but anyways, that was really, that, that was, that, the peak of our drug existence was that, you know? Now, you know, drugs for me are like, you know, Sinex, <laughs> you know, Pepsi AC. Yeah, yeah, this is really good stuff. Yeah, thank you. But you know, uh, by the way, I don't think the monkeys were into hard drugs. Come to think of it, they were they were drinkers too. Um, but you know, a lot of the really squeaky clean bands that 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 were you know above reproach were all into the hard drugs, and it was just the opposite of what you would think. Yeah, you know, exactly. But Coop had a very good uh, principle, and uh, I was very happy to hear this right at the very first performance. He would carry a can of beer around on the stage usually. But he never took more than one sip out of any open can of beer. It would come open, he would take a sip from it, put it down, a prop man would come and get it and replace it with a fresh can right away because he was deathly afraid, and rightly so, that somebody might drop something into that can of beer. It could be harmful to him. That was a wise decision. Early in our career, we did shows with the Grateful Dead. <laughs> Who felt that it was their obligation to turn everybody on to LSD in 1968? And I mean, I, ever, I, I would sit there with my hand over my beer like this. <laughs> the last thing you want to do is be on stage as Alice Cooper and then come on to LSD. I mean, that would be the year in the guillotine going, wait a minute, what am I doing it? <laughs> you know? So, anyways, we never got into psychedelics, you know, at least I didn't, you know, and. Uh, and our show was crazy enough where you didn't really want to be involved in anything like that. Oh, and I never drank on stage. Uh, when I finally quit drinking, which was like 30 years ago, I, I went in and my psychiatrist said, well, he says, now, he says, how much, uh, how much do you drink on stage? And I went, I never drink on stage. And he says, well, when you're doing a movie, how much do you drink when you? I said, I never drink when I'm acting. He says, let me get this straight. Alice doesn't drink. I said, yeah. And he says, but you do. <laughs> yeah. He goes, so Alice is not the alcoholic here, is he? <laughs> you know, because I kept blaming everything on Alice, you know, because he was an easy scapegoat. Why would I do it? Because of Alice, you know. Uh, and realized that actually Dr. Jekyll was much, much worse than Mr. Hyde. And uh, that, that's what I really realized, that when I did work, I was never drunk. Or I had to actually make it look like I was drunk, because people wanted me to look like that. You know, but I, I never drank when I was actually working, performing. It was the other 22 hours, you know, that... that, that so, I mean, and, and that was a revelation to me, you know. And do you, you remember when we hit... Uh, what, what was it? Not, it wasn't Phoenix, no, where, it was... Uh, uh, I'm sorry, you'll, you'll come up with the city in a moment for me when you realize what I'm about to say. Uh, I, we checked into a hotel, and uh, I went out on the balcony in the back, had a beautiful view of the parking lot, and I looked over to the adjacent balcony, and here's Coop standing there. And Coop points down into the parking lot and says, what the hell is that? A big white van with a, with a, a, a jet motor on the top of it, yeah. Yeah, like from an electric plane. And it had written on the side of it, now there'd be some recognition here, I think, Domesticon was written down the side of it in big black letters. And I said, I don't know what he said. I don't know either. What is it? It's a weird device anyway. So we retired and went to bed. The next morning, I was supposed to be in Time Magazine. That was Monday morning. And Time Magazine comes out on the stands on a Monday morning. And I was down at the newsstand. I said, is Time Magazine out yet? And the lady at the counter said, uh, no, not yet, but this gentleman is waiting for it, too. And I looked over, and here is um, Woody Allen standing there. And I had met him before. 
I went over and reintroduced myself, and he remembered me day day, I'm sure. And uh, he said, what are you doing in the, the hotel here? And I said, well, I'm the Alice Cooper group. He says, is Alice in the, in the hotel? And I, I said, yeah. I took a piece of paper and I said, this is secret, and I wrote down your room number and gave it to him. Later on that night, when I walked into the arena, he comes rushing over to me and said, you sent Woody Allen to my room. And I thought, I'm going to get it now. And he said, oh, wonderful. He embraced me. <laughs> wonderful, wonderful. I'm in this new movie. <laughs> and he is in a sleeper. Yes. Sleeper, he, he's standing at the side of the highway, not in makeup or anything like that, and he's just standing, hitching a ride from the domestic on. That was the, 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 the big white van that contained the servants that had the thing plugged into their mouth and whatnot. And you may remember it if you remember the movie Sleeping Hell. I'm going to go on murder, obviously, right now, of course. And uh, that's where they had the McDonald's sign where it said, uh, so many sold, and the figure went all the way down along the desert <laughs> into infinity. Uh, it was zero, zero, zero all the way along. And uh, so you actually got into the movie. You yeah, Woody, Woody was a, actually, uh, um, uh, I was a reference in two or three movies in Annie Hall. Oh, yeah, yeah. yeah. He had a joke about me in Annie Hall, and there was another one in Celebrity where he was talking about this rock star that had snakes up in the room and everything like that. So there was a, there was a little bit of a, I was a big Woody Allen fan. I thought I'll, you know, take the money and run. So was that the first time that you met Woody Allen? Uh, actually, it was. It was. Yeah. But I, you know, uh, living in New York, I'd seen him at Elaine's, you know, and bumped into him a few times. But it was, I didn't really realize that he was very, pretty much an Alice Cooper fan. Oh, yes, yeah, he was. Yeah. yeah, so it was he, really he nice. when I really said that. Yeah, it was, uh, it was an easy, unique character. Very, I just saw this new movie. It said it's actually very good. Yeah, you know, the Rome with Love or whatever. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. I, I kind of wish you'd go back to the, you know, uh, the early Woody Allen movies. I thought those were really, really astounding. It's a different phase, I yeah. suppose. Yeah. yeah. But the movies are very clever. They're very good. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. You guys have such incredible chemistry together with each other, and yet you've only... Not illegal, either. <laughs> <laughs> Legal well, chemistry. I know, alcohol only. <laughs> <laughs> um, it, it, but... Basically, Mr. Randy, you've only worked with Mr. Cooper on one tour, which was the Billion Dollar Babies. One right? tour, and I say it was 90 days, but it went a bit longer than that because we went to Brazil. Right. And we, I was we, we went to other countries, yeah. Well, we went all over Europe. Now, the Brazil trip was a, this was a good one. Oh, yeah. Okay, so they never had a rock concert in Brazil, ever. <laughs> We're talking about Rio de Janeiro now, a huge, huge city. Yeah, so we're playing our Sao Paulo, 38 million people. And Alice Cooper shows up down there. 158,000 people indoors. You set a record. It was Artists, Guinness Book indoors, of Records. Yeah. Ten and ten. Guinness Book of Records is, you know, they had a place that was eight times the size of Madison Square Garden. And you couldn't see the end of it, could you? you? Couldn't, with binoculars, you couldn't see the end. Now, if you take 158,000 Brazilians and they all go, <laughs> At once, it's deafening. 158,000 drunk, stoned Brazilians at the top of their lungs. And I'm standing this close to a wall of amps the size of this wall. I can't hear a thing. And, and the thing that I remember most about it, the next morning, I get up and there's the newspaper, front page, the whole picture. And it's a picture of me with a snake around and a sword and the blood. And it just says, Macumba. <laughs> Did you realize that 70 or 80 percent of people under the equator believe in Macumba, which is a, a, a little bit of voodoo, Catholicism, this, that, and that. And so I walked down the street, and people were like, you know, hiding their children. <laughs> kind of good, you know. I said, go. You can't. He enjoyed it better. Yeah, it was, it was a Macumba god, you know. And you know, it, it was really a great kind of feeling that you know people were like. Running like that, and I said, "This I love being the villain. This is, that even fed my villainous uh, uh, appetite even better." But I'm sure you remember that the stage was very, very high, yeah. very high, and it was so it was so high that we almost had a disaster there. The crowd, this mass of people, was all pushing in. They're all standing, you see. There are no chairs for them standing, and they were. We had to reach down. And the roadies had to hold us by the ankles and watch out what they could to hold the kids up because they were getting crushed yeah. by the crowd behind them. They could have died. Yeah. It was, well, the way, there were three births.
during the concert. And you're not responsible for any of that. I'm not responsible for any education. I think there were three people died of old age. Uh, it, it, was, it was a city, 158,000 yeah. people in a yeah. city, so it was like, you know, what would happen in a city. So when you look at that crowd, it was, it just went off to the horizon in this city. Yeah. It was a monstrous And movie. it was indoors. It wasn't the biggest outdoor audience, but it was the biggest indoor audience. Now, Kiss came in after that and did 144, so we still have the record. We and still have the record. Tell me the story. I, I, I don't have any of the details. Where Chef, Chef Thornton used some ingenious, I mean, we all know that, he used really ingenious ways in and out of problems of all kinds. And I think when we were at home, I, my memory doesn't serve me well in this respect, and we knew that the count of heads was wrong. And there were some eight by 10 cameras there that took pictures of the audience. And Chef held up the show until they had prints and could put pinholes through every head in the audience, every face that we could see there, counting them up as we went along. And we had been shortchanged by something like 30% yeah. of the, the head count in the audience. But that's how Chef Gordon thought. Yeah. He thought so well, so efficient. Well, you know, he was he's still my manager 43 years later. Chef and I are still together. And we don't have a contract with each other. We've never had a, you know, it's all been on a handshake. So Chef is still, you know, blasting away, putting the new show together right now, actually, in, in Hawaii. And, um, and so uh, I, the, one of the strangest things that happened early, early on in the career was the Toronto show with the chicken, okay? <laughs> now, we had no idea. This was just going to be a big hundred and, I think there was maybe 100,000 people in Toronto. I was going to go on between the doors and John Lennon and John and Yoko. And Chef put this whole thing together for these Canadian guys, and they were going to pay him. He said, I don't want to be paid. I want Alice to go on between these two acts at the prime time. That was, my, that was his payment. That's how managers think, you know. Good managers. Yeah. So we're up there on stage. And at the very end of our show, we used to open pillows up. A feather pillow. That one feather pillow would fill this room with CO2 oh, yeah. cartridges. It would look like a snowstorm. We had five feather pillows up there. And they're like in and Jim Morrison's over here in the door, so they're going, yeah, this is great. John Lennon's going, yes, this is wonderful. And I all of a sudden, I look down, and there's a chicken <laughs> on stage. And I went, well, I didn't bring it. <laughs> <laughs> um, it's appropriate, because it's a white chicken. And, you know, being from Detroit, I'd never been on a farm in my life. You know, I figured, well, it's got wings, it's got feathers. <laughs> It should fly. <laughs> so I picked it up nicely and just kind of chucked it into the audience. I figured, well, somebody's going to get a great souvenir. <laughs> well, they didn't. They don't fly as much as they plummet <laughs> into the audience. And the audience tears it to pieces. This was called the Toronto Peace Festival. <laughs> a piece of this, a piece of that, a piece of this. And they throw the rest of it back on stage. Now it's this mutilated chicken, you know. Next day in the paper, of course, Alice Cooper kills chicken and drinks blood. And, uh, you know, and if you saw Alice, you would go, okay, leave that. You know, because I mean, you would, you would see this character and think, well, that's what happened. Um, the kicker to the story is the first five rows were all in wheelchairs. <laughs> so <laughs> it's the people in wheelchairs that killed the chicken. <laughs> To this day, I'm thinking, <laughs> let's take it back to the basics. Let me see, I got my keys, I got my wallet, I got my tickets, I got my chicken. <laughs> Who brings a chicken to an Alice Cooper concert? <laughs> and then I thought, the only person that could have brought the chicken is Chef. Knowing this was going to happen. You know, knowing that it was going to, you know, Frank Zappa called me the next day, he said, did you kill the chicken on stage? I said, yeah. I went, no. He said, well, don't tell anybody. They love it. <laughs> okay. You know, the next thing when people would say, did you kill a chicken? I went, no, I don't want to talk about that. <laughs> and to this day, I go into the city, and it's the ASPCA. is there. Are you going to kill chickens? <laughs> I went, no, I'm not going to kill a chicken. I, and in the reality, I never would kill any animal, ever. You know, but that was the reputation we got to. To this day, the chicken, they never mentioned Colonel Sanders. <laughs> it was like killed billions of chickens. You know, one chicken. 
it's, it's like, you know, eat one missionary and you're a cannibal, right? <laughs> Yeah, we're having a fight over it. Okay. Yes. 
but this is the original Alice Cooper head. And from uh, and from this one, the other ones are old. Right. How many did you make? Over they, here? they have to make uh, five or six of them. And with the one we use now is still from that cast. Is it? Yeah. Wow. Yeah. So you hold on to that. But uh, I'm going to ask you to autograph this. Oh, absolutely. Uh, when the time yeah. comes, we, yeah. we need a special autographing event for this, of course. Yeah. And this is the original, the very first one. I wasn't there when the thing was being cast on, on your on your face, but I was there when they were finishing it off afterwards. And uh, I've still got a couple of souvenir pictures of that that are mementos of my my wasted youth. <laughs> <laughs> but that is the original, ladies and gentlemen. That the makeup I didn't know you had it. That's great. No, I didn't put that thing up on someone else. Did, so yeah. there you, go. you know, I think I got to tell you a great story about Randy. Uh oh. Randy is carries a check in his wallet. He used to. Do you have it now? You know, I don't carry the check anymore because we don't do business that way. That's they old, take that credit way. now. That's what old folks would do. Okay. <laughs> to debunk anybody that could. Proved that Marie Geller did, was psychic. <laughs> or any psychic. Any psychic, psychic, psychic that matter, yeah. Marie Geller happened to be the guy that was the hot guy at the time. At the time. Yeah. Yes. And uh, it was really a unique thing because everybody was into psychics. Everybody want, wanted to believe in this. And here was Randy going against the flow, going, no. He says, uh, you got to prove that to me. Well, under the state and display table outside, we actually have million dollar checks signed by me, but it says right there in small type that this is not a valid check for an essential check. But there was a time when you did have a check that was. Oh, yeah, I had $10,000. $10,000. dollars check, and that was the initial. I would sacrifice that immediately if somebody did something really psychic. Yeah, that's, that's an amazing thing, you know, that, that, that somebody would go against the flow of everybody wanting to believe in this to go the other way. Well, well, well the, the thing is, these so-called psychics are doing a lot of damage to a younger generation. They're getting them thinking in the wrong way. I don't deny that there are psychic phenomena, ha phenomena, pardon me, happening. I don't deny that because I can't prove a negative of that sort. But I offer the million dollars, it's not mine, it belongs to the foundation that I represent, a million dollars is a huge carrot to hang out there, even in today's inflation. Uh, it still is a good sum of money to offer as a prize to anyone who can prove that they have psychic powers. They should be lined up outside this hotel right now waiting to claim the million dollars because there are tens of thousands of them all over the world. We get applications for it all the time. But the only applications that come in are not from Marie Geller or, or Sylvia Brown or other people like her, John Edward. None of these people. They have applied for this oh, I'm not interested. They're very interested in a million dollars, particularly to make me look like some sort of a fool. But the ones we get them from are from people who genuinely believe they have psychic powers. And we test them uh, every year in Las Vegas and all the way through the year and around the world through other experts, other scientists who can handle that sort of thing for us. And I never sit in on it, you know why? Because, because the psychics have adopted uh, an attitude now. No, if James Randi is there, he'll put out negative vibrations so I can't be psychic. <laughs> Duh. So when I did a test with the BBC for a homeopathy, they said, well, we'll, we'll call you in. I said, no, 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 I wanted you to wait 48 hours after the test. You're all done, all tabulated in the computer and say, then tell me that the experiment has been done. And that's exactly what they do, and of course, tell me how it didn't work either. But uh, th that, that, that prize, that check, I did carry it around for 10000 Yeah, for a long time. For um, a long time. Now, see, I went to, to, to claim the check because I thought he said psychos. <laughs> and, I said, uh, and you would have won. I would have won that much. So I had this great idea, and I was going to bring it to you for a reality show about when they were trying to catch Bin Laden. I said, why don't they put 10 psychics and a helicopter over in Afghanistan? And push them on. You know, and... <laughs> no, he said, put them up over there. And they can find a little girl buried, you know, in Idaho behind a barn by looking at a dress or something. And I go, why can't they find this guy? So I said, put these guys on there, the 10 tough psychics, put them over Afghanistan. And the guy, it, the guy that comes up with the least each week gets voted off the helicopter. <laughs> he said, don't worry, you should have known this was coming. Number seven, number seven, stand, step forward, please, open the door. So, and if you win, it's $25 million. I mean, you come
couldn't catch the guy. We're going to get $25 million. Well, they were going to, we were going to pay $25 million to whoever caught Bin Laden, right? Well, so yeah. so well, if they do win, it's win-win. We get the guy, right? Wow. So it, it, it never came to fruition. Nobody wanted to do it. it was, but I was going to call you and say, I was going to put you in charge of this. Well, because you would have been perfect for that. Yeah, think of the van line. Yeah. Hold <laughs> on. So, ladies and gentlemen, we come to the close of our panel. I know it's only been, yeah, I know. We have to do this. I'm so sorry. But on a good note, uh, immediately following this panel, uh, Mr. Cooper will be doing autographs at 6 p.m., not immediately following this panel, but at 6 p.m. in room 208 in the Hilton. Room 208, wait, wait, 208. Yeah, you knew that was getting so <laughs> Room 208 in the Hilton, uh, actually all weekend long. Um, Mr. Randy will be everywhere. I, I just don't know much of what to say about you two. You guys have been fantastic, incredible. Thank you. Thank you. Uh,